Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're just going to go ahead and wait about a minute or two before we get started on this beautiful Friday before a, a nice weekend here. So um, if you could just bear with us, we'll uh, get our native tree talk going in just a second. So for those of you who uh, were here earlier in the year, we did a native perennial talk. This is kind of part two, natives in the landscape, and we're really focusing on trees. Um, <clears throat> and a majority of the trees that uh, we're gonna discuss today are really found in the Chicagoland area, but I did pick a couple native trees that are native to Illinois in general that I think are really probably pretty important to note. Uh, certainly, I don't think anyone can argue the fact that we've seen some changes in our weather patterns as of late. And so we are having uh, some more wet years than normal. Um, we're kind of in a drought right now. Um, and what really hasn't necessarily changed is the cold weather in the winter. And that's usually a factor um, in our native trees. So even though we see all these temperatures in certain areas getting warmer and moisture getting less, uh, and in some cases more, depending on where you live, uh, our temperatures in the winter times are still pretty cold. And so that really influences a lot of what we do around here. So um, happy to be here for uh, part two of Natives in the Landscape. And with that, I think we're gonna get started. Um, and then if we have any questions that roll in, we'll try to answer those at the end of the presentation, but wanna be sensitive to your time as well. And so why plant native? Um, this really is the same reason we plant native perennials. So we want to preserve uh, some of the bio biodiversity um, in Lake Forest, uh, where I'm actually originally from. We've had a lot of changes due to plant material and invasives moving in. We want to support our local wildlife and insects. Um, Non-invasiveness in native plants. Most plants that are native to the area are not invasive. Um, a lot of people, especially in native air, natural areas management, are experiencing calorie pears becoming an invasive. Believe it or not, burning bushes becoming an invasive. Um, and then for those of you um, who live in the city, maybe it's tree of heaven. Others, it may be box elders. So there's a lot of invasive plants that are out there. And typically, you don't hear anyone saying, you know, the oaks are just too invasive. You know, they're taking over my yard. Um, as a matter of fact, one acorn. Uh, it's usually one in 10,000 becomes an, a, a, a mature tree. Um, they generally are easy to grow and cheaper to maintain. And by maintaining, we mean that they require less pesticides, less fertilizers, less herbicides uh, than some of the other plants that we grow. And they usually provide year-round beauty. That could be in the sense of berries, that could be the form, the shape, the structure, all of which we'll talk about here shortly. So most importantly, it's the right place for the right location, right? We don't want to plant an oak tree right in front of our front door uh, because it's a small tree when we buy it. Uh, oak trees get really big, as we know. Uh, and so we look at trees as being three different sizes. We look at them as being large, medium, and low growing. Low growing can also be uh, termed ornamental. Uh, so our large canopy trees are 50 foot or greater. That might be American elm, some of the oaks we talked about, medium canopy trees. Uh, that could be something like um, around here, a birch tree, um, and then a low growing tree could be a, um, an ironwood tree or a blue beech, a uh, hop horn beam, those would be kind of in the ornamental. Uh, hawthorns and crab apples also fit that. Also then important to note is how much sun do we need? Um, you know, it's funny, I always hear part sun, part shade. It's, is the glass hat is the glass half full or half empty. Um, it really comes out to be four to six hours of sun is considered part sun, part shade. So, you know, those two words are somewhat uh, able to be interchangeable. Six or more hours is considered full sun, less than four hours of sun is considered shade. Although I do believe that there's a difference between having filtered light and deep shade. So keep that in mind when you're picking your trees. There are trees that will grow fine, but maybe they'll be a little bit leggier. Uh, maybe they won't flower as much. Maybe they won't get as good a fall color. Um, and then, of course, our soils, uh, probably one of the most important things that we need to think about when we're planting a tree around here is what is the pH of the soil? Typically, you'll find in Lake County and Cook County, we're at a 7.2 to 7.3, which is more on the alkaline side of things. 
acidity is anything less than seven, seven is neutral. And so a lot of our oaks, a lot of our evergreens prefer an acidic soil. And it's very hard for us to turn the soil around. Um, you can go ahead and add amendments, but when you look at the scope and the size of the soil and where our roots typically are, they're outside the drip line of the tree, it's really hard to change that soil. And so we'll touch base on a couple of these things, but with uh, some of our maples, specifically our red maples, you know, we have a heavy clay soil here. So our soils are not releasing manganese. A lot of people think it's iron, but with our oaks and birches, they're not being able to access iron out of our soil. So a lot of times we acidify the soil. Uh, we may treat the plants themselves or the soil by adding some of these nutrients uh, to help plants photosynthesize. But um, that's usually a common problem with a lot of our plants is they can't pull certain elements out of the soil. And of course, our hardiness zone. And that's really what I talked about earlier is, you know, are these plants cold hardy? So when you look at this map, and this map seems to be progressively changing uh, as we're experiencing these different changes in our weather patterns. But when you look at where we live and you have to zoom in really close to Lake Michigan, you can kind of see we're in that green area or that zone six. That certainly can change depending on where you are in Lake and Cook County. So Route 41 could be a dividing line of almost 10 degrees or more. So warmer in the winters by the lake, certainly if we plant some trees in a courtyard setting, um, you can go ahead and screen them from our, our westerly winds, some of the cold temperatures that come out. Um, also, if you're planting a tree closer to the house, you may get some radiant heat in the wintertime. So those are some factors that really need to come in play here. And so soil is the tree right for this area. A red maple in Florida is not the same red maple here in the Chicagoland area. Even though they may be an acer, their seed source is completely different and they're used to different types of extremes and temperatures. So we're going to kick off uh, today's talk with the hackberry. Hackberry was a replacement for the elm when many of us lost elms due to uh, Dutch elm disease. Many of us think Dutch elm disease is long gone. It really isn't. Uh, just like emerald ash borer, um, when you go ahead and you provide a food source for these insects and diseases, uh, we find that usually they stick around. Maybe not in the numbers. A lot of the emerald ash borers have kind of dwindled in numbers. Dutch elm disease is still a threat. Unfortunately, I've seen a lot of really nice big hackberry or elms die still because of Dutch elm disease. And so when you look at this overall shape, you'll see the picture on the left has somewhat of a vase shape or a whisk broom shape, I like to say, very characteristic of an elm. The fall color is almost similar. And if you look at the leaf, it kind of resembles an elm. Um, hackberry is a urban tolerant tree. It's large, tough, fast growing. Um, it has somewhat of the base shape as we talked about, 60 feet in height. Although this is one of those trees that I found as a city forester that is a little slow in getting going. And so a lot of trees are taken from the nursery at two and a half, three, four inches in diameter. It's measured at six inches off the ground. And that's a little different than circumference. Um, and they seem to sit a little bit idle for the first year, two or three. Um, they may be a little yellow in their appearance. And so they seem to have a little bit of transplant shock more than most. Um, but once they get going, they clip along at a, I would say, medium to um, high growth rate. Uh, you could see growth for anywhere from eight to 12 inches, depending on where it's at. Again, a lot of that has to do with soils, moisture. We typically lose more plants because of overwatering than underwatering. And so once we get our urban trees established, our native trees, they really, as we talked about, need less maintenance and really need less water. So when we think about our oaks, you know, our heritage oaks, they've been here for hundreds of years. They've really weathered every extreme from too much water to not enough water. Um, they put down their roots uh, for the last 200 years and they can certainly weather the storm, so to speak. What makes this tree a little bit neat, different than the elms is that they have a quirky warty bark, uh, almost like pimples, which I'll show you here. Um, and uh, even though they kind of have a, a silly name, hackberry, um, they're actually great for wildlife. It's not a messy fruit. It's not like an apple tree or a pear tree that leaves a lot of big mess. This is more like a um, newer version of a crab apple that has a smaller berry and kind of shrivels up if the birds don't get it to the size of a pea. So this is what makes hackberry somewhat unique is this uh, pimply and warty bark. Um, you know, I'm a big advocate of, you know, getting into plants, touching 
um, using my senses, smelling their leaves, you know, feeling the trunks of the trees. This one is certainly recognizable, not only visually, but to the touch as well. Um, it ends up being a smooth bark tree, as many trees do when it's younger. And then as it grows and matures, it gets corkier. This cork and this pimple uh, wardiness will follow the tree up to, into the canopy. Um, but the smaller, newer branches will kind of remain smooth until uh, they mature. One of the problems with hackberries is it gets this nipple gall. For a lot of people, they have a hard time with the aesthetics of certain trees. And I can assure you that almost every plant out there has some type of pest problem or disease problem. Some of them are um, more aesthetic. Some of them are terminal in many cases, like Dutch elm disease and emerald ash borer, like we talked about. This happens to be just what I call tree acne, right? This is like a 16 year old, you know, getting acne. Um, this is a tree's version of getting a pimple um, and not all the leaves get it. It's somewhat cyclical, a lot of times caused by a parasitic wasp, uh, like a lot of our galls. Um, and so this is just a bump on the leaf. It has nothing to do with the survivability of the tree or the health of the tree. Uh, it's more of an aesthetic quality. But when you look at the long-term characteristics this tree has to offer by way of wildlife, by way of providing shade, by way of you know cascading over our streets, this is really a great durable tree. Next tree is ironwood or hop hornbeam. Um, there's a tree that we're gonna cover next, which is uh, very similar. A lot of times people get them confused just by the uh, appearance that they're a small ornamental tree. And I'll go ahead and share with you kind of the distinct differences between the two. Um, but, you know, certainly one of the characteristics of this tree, not only is its bark, but this great fall color that you see to the right. Um, it is one that you'll find in a lot of native areas. Uh, whether it's self-sowing or not. Um, it's usually in ravines and woodlands, like the next tree we're going to discuss. Um, this is one, though, that uh, can be a little finicky as well when you transplant it. It's not readily available in the nurseries, um, but when you do find it, it's going to prefer kind of that part shade to shade situation. Um, I find that if this tree is in the sun, it just does not do well. Usually secondary infections like boars move in. And so um, placed well, this will be a great tree with a long uh, life in your landscape. Placed in the wrong spot or a area where it gets too much water, it's just unfortunately not going to be happy. So as we mentioned, it is a ornamental, so 20 to 30 feet in height. Great for naturalizing the gardens. Uh, the fruits and that lets mature in the fall, so they resemble hops. It has the same kind of look. Uh, and some of the fruit is some of the birch with, with its catkins, which are kind of a long fruit. Um, and I'll show you a picture of the hops-like fruit. It's a real nice chartreuse color. Um, actually makes great cuttings if you want to go ahead and put it in a vase uh, and spruce up some of your flower arrangements, some of your um, things that you do. It's a great uh, little thing for interest. Um, it is uh, related to uh, the birches, but it doesn't seem to have the same insect and disease problems. Uh, with our birch, uh, a lot of times, especially the white paper bark birch, they get bores. This one certainly doesn't. So here's the bark. Uh, it's a little bit tighter. It's somewhat exfoliating. Um, it's not like a shag bark hickory, um, and it's not like a larger silver maple. These are smaller, thinner um, exfoliations. Uh, this is a really incredibly dense wood tree. This is great tree for those who do woodworking. Uh, a lot of the woodworking crafts that are out there, um, as far as like the sculptures of eagles and ducks, ironwood is a great product, great tree to use for that. Here's the hops, um, like I said, kind of a um, hops looking flower, um, kind of that chartreuse look. When this is in and around the plant, it really uh, offsets the tree and makes it look really nice. Now, kind of its partner in crime, if you will, is the American hornbeam uh, musclewood blue beech. Um, as we discussed in the perennial talk, uh, a lot of common names people use regionally. And so here we have three different common names that we use for this. Scientific name is Carpinus. Um, and so if I say musclewood to you, um, people might think ironwood is considered musclewood. But in this case, um, this is Carpinus caroliliana. Um, we have blue beech here. You can also see it has a great fall color, very similar shape. You can see the distinct difference in the bark sometimes referred to as muscle wood because if you were to flex your arm and look at the tricep of your arm, this kind of resembles that. Um, this is a great native plant that we find in a lot of ravines here in the North Shore, uh, growing naturally, not one that needs to be sown. 
um, or planted because we'll normally find it uh, readily available. There's a couple of different cultivars that are coming online that have really good um, fall color. Keep in mind with a lot of these natives, especially from seed, they end up having some variability in their color. So when we find a cultivar that we like for one of its attributes, such as fall color, shape, size, fruits, um, we seem to lean on that for that particular characteristic. So there's a lot of them that are out there, a lot of them that have great consistent reddish to purple color. Um, and then this, as I mentioned, has this really great look to the trunk, almost like the muscle of a tricep. Um, and so I would consider this really a four season species um, and it's very shade tolerant. You know, a lot of the North Shore has a lot of shade. Typically we look for evergreens to screen our neighbors. We look for evergreens to provide privacy. And so we're kind of limited on what types of shade trees and ornamentals we can plant. And this is certainly a good one to consider. Here's just a close up, you know, again, if you flex the back of your arm and you look at the tricep, um, and when you do see these, I recommend that you touch them, that you, you, you kind of experience just the density and the muscularness of this particular plant. Kentucky coffee tree, um, boy, let me tell you, there are not a lot of Kentucky coffee trees in the area when you think of large trees. When you find them, you can't help but notice them. They are a tough sell. Uh, whether you're a forester, a landscape designer, landscape architect, they're a tough sell when they are smaller. They're very stark. Uh, there's not a lot of branches, but you can see in this middle picture as well as uh, the right picture, they get really big and broad. But getting to that size takes a little bit of time. It takes a little bit of patience. Um, there are people who like the fact that it has the leaflets over to the left. There's other people who think that they're too messy. Um, I find them to just be like a normal uh, maple or sycamore tree when they lose their leaves. Um, not so much like a honey locust that has smaller leaves and kind of blow away. So there is a little bit of fall cleanup to them. But the fall color, the bright yellow is really outstanding. Um, it is a big tree, but like I said, they're few and far in between. I know of a handful of them that are 60 feet tall. They're absolutely gorgeous. They are an older version of this Kentucky coffee tree. And what do I mean by that? Well, we have gone ahead and we've bred a lot of things out of certain trees. Some of the complaints on this tree were that they had seed pods, which I'll show you here in a second. So we have created a plant now called Espresso pretty catchy name, uh, which is a seedless version of this tree. So it makes cleanup a lot more easy. Uh, it's not as interesting as some of the characteristics uh, go, but uh, again, it's just one of those things that has changed over time um, that has made maintenance and cleanup a lot easier. So the seeds were used for as a coffee substitute. Um, as I mentioned, it does have uh, it is a fairly large crown. Um, it's great for parks, great for open areas. You'll find this tree in a lot of uh, municipal areas because it is pretty much insect and disease resistant. Like I said, it's a tough tree for people to digest when it comes in at three inch and you see three branches. It's not gonna have the same canopy as maybe some of your oaks or maples do, um, but nonetheless, it is a urban tolerant tree um, with some great bark as well. You'll find the bark on this tree to be more like platelets than kind of the pimply warty uh, look that we saw in the hackberry. Platelets to the right, some people might argue it looks like uh, a cherry tree or it looks like potato chips. Those are the seed pods to the left. The new cultivars like Espresso have gone ahead and genetically removed these seed pods. Um, and so outside of the leaflets, the long leaflets that can be upwards of three feet or length, it's a great durable tree. Here's kind of a close up. And so when you look at that picture to the right, you can see the seed pod on that. And if you were to follow that petiole back, that petiole breaks at the stem. And so all those leaves on that long petiole break off along with that seed pod. This is just a picture of an immature seed. It hasn't browned yet. Um, as those seeds kind of brown and dry out, they will open and some of the pods will fall out. Um, although it's not messy in that sense that you may only get one or two popping out and the rest remain in the pods for cleanup in the fall time. Overcup oak. Uh, this is one that uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, I'm kind of stretching down to a little bit further south. So uh, technically it's not native to the Chicago area, but it is native to Illinois. Um, I just feel like with the changing weather climates, um, we need to kind of look at different trees. Unfortunately enough, we are experiencing some new things that are happening when, on the front of insect and disease. Um, for many, many years, um, we have been fighting exotic pests. We have been fighting 
gypsy moth, we've been fighting Dutch elm disease, we've been fighting Asian longhorn beetle, and we really have not been fighting many native pests. Unfortunately, um, lately we've been seeing new funguses uh, come up and around because of the cool, or I'm sorry, the humid moisture that we've had in the springtime. So diseases like bur oak blight, oak wilt, these are all diseases that are now kind of rearing their head and they're affecting our native trees. And so for so many years, we fought these exotic pests because they were coming into the country. And now because we're seeing changes in our weather patterns, we're fighting native pests. And so I think it's good that we start to take a step back. We look at these trees that again are cold tolerant, um, but we kind of go out of the six region area in the Chicago area and look at other trees. Um, there is an overcup oak that they think is native to the DePage area. Um, and so that's why I put this one in here because I think it's a great substitute for some of the birds and whites. And I'm not encouraging you necessarily to get away from those, um, but I do encourage more diversity than anything else. And so this is called overcup oak because when you see the acorn, uh, the husk covers a majority of the oak. Um, and this is an oak that, um, you know, I think really has some potential in this area um, and one that I would encourage you to try to find. With that said, you know, when we're talking about these native species, you know, a lot of these trees can only be dug in the springtime. So we have two times that we dig trees, spring and fall. Some trees can be dug spring and fall. A lot of the oaks, the birches, some of the maples, some of the other natives are spring dig. Um, here at the nursery in Wilmette, we actually have taken that in consideration. And so we have a lot of trees that were dug in the springtime and are available for you to plant. And fall is a great time to do planting. Um, and one of the reasons I like fall is because it's a little bit cooler. You're not having to carry these trees through the hot summer like we've just had. We're taking advantage of the fall rains, the winter snows, and then the spring rains, where at that point they should start to be getting established. Um, and so even though we wouldn't be able to dig an oak right now and get it out of the nursery, we have plenty for you to pick from, and it's a great time to get these planted. And so overcup oak, um, again, a little obscure, but one that you should kind of put on your radar. It is a big oak, like a lot of the oaks that we see here, 50, 65 feet in high. 65 feet, excuse me, in height. Um, and it's in the white oak group. And what do I mean by that? Well, typically we have the white oak and the red oak group. You'll find that red oaks usually have a pointier leaf and white oaks usually have a lobed leaf. Uh, and so that's kind of two distinguishing categories that separate the trees. So when we talk about white oaks, we're talking about white oak, swamp white oak, overcup oak, red oaks could be pin oaks, black oaks, and red oaks, and they just have a pointier leaf. Um, and so when you're IDing these trees, this will help you ID them um, at least into that category then, which will allow you to go ahead and narrow that down. Um, and what's nice about this particular oak is it is native to lowland areas. So for those of you who have soupy areas, um, this is one that you can get to grow um, pretty well. So river birch, um, you know, this is a love-hate relationship with this plant. Um, like most of you, I love the bark on this tree. I love the fall color. Who doesn't love a birch? This is a native birch to our area, um, and it is not prone to birch, bronze birch borer, which uh, takes out our paper birches. That's why you don't see natural paper bark birch here. There is a cultivar called the white spire, which is resistant to bronze birch borer. Um, the problem that, uh, you know, I have with this particular tree is if you just look at the name river birch, we see too many people plant, planting these as foundation plants. And a lot of times they end up drying out. This particular plant does like it moist. If you go into the Ohio corridor, you'll see this plant just in enormous sizes. The soils are a little bit different there. The other thing to keep in mind about this particular plant is it gets to the point where we just start to appreciate it and we start to notice that maybe along the veins, they're getting a little bit darker and the leaf is getting a little bit lighter in color. That's the iron that I talked about where this tree can't pull iron out of the soil. And for some reason, um, it seems to get about 45 feet tall when those types of problems occur. When they're younger, they're more vigorous, they are able to work through that. But as these trees get chlorotic or you get this yellow appearance, whether it's in these oaks or maples or birch in this case, they can't pull those nutrients out of the soil. And because they're yellowing, they're not photosynthesizing or creating enough food and they slowly die. And so, um, like I said, one of my favorites as far as um, the bark, uh, it's one of the trees that you'll see in the clumps, sometimes clumps of three or five. Um, and so you don't see a lot of river birch and single stem like the next tree I'm gonna show you. Um, 
but it is a great tree. Uh, it, it has great fall color and great exfoliating bark. So if you are going to use it, I encourage you not to use it, you know, along an area that's relatively dry and you find a moist area for it. Um, and so, uh, like I said, it's got the chalky white cinnamon bark uh, that peels that everybody loves. Um, the leaves go from a golden to orange to a copper uh, color, depending on uh, where you're at. Um, and it's for the most part bore resistant. They have actually taken this plant and there's one called Fox Valley River Birch, which is a dwarf version of this. So if you like an exfoliating bark, but you're not looking for um, kind of a medium range tree, this other kind of dwarf river birch is certainly a great contender. Um, probably gets around the 10 to 12 foot range if I'm not mistaken, but you get that exfoliating bark certainly makes a great hedge. Um, not one that you would uniquely see as a hedge, but hedge as well. Um, has similar leaf to some of the other plants like the Carpinus we looked at earlier that also makes a great hedge. And so one that we don't see, uh, which I actually like, is yellow birch. And so, you know, we're used to seeing the white spire birch, again, having a white bark. Um, we're used to seeing the river birch, but this is one that actually is native to this area and we'll find it in woodland areas, not in any abundance because it doesn't like to seed in shady areas. A lot of times the plants that we have live in a symbiotic relationship and they help each other out and they certainly don't want to overcompete for food. And so you might have a tree that's in a woodland area that is maybe six inches in diameter and you think it's a young tree, but when in fact it could be 30 or 40 years old. And so as these trees are communicating underground and they're talking through the root system, which many of them do, and they supply each other with other nutrients and stuff, they're all kind of working to survive and ensure that the longevity of the plant is around. And so this particular one just does not seem to seed as heavily um, as some of the others, but you wanna talk about a tree that has some great attributes. Um, it can live for a long time, 60 to 80 feet tall, um, you'll find a lot of these, especially up north in the Wisconsin Door County area. If you look hard enough, you will find them in our areas. Um, but, you know, if you look at this picture, the fall color is amazing. The bark on it is great. Those are those catkins I talked about earlier with some of the other trees. That's their seed. They also get these strobilize, which are small nutlets. Um, but boy, let me tell you, this is a plant that is just um, underused, harder to find in the nursery, even for our plant buyers to find. Um, but you'll sometimes come across these at native tree sales. Um, when you do, they're quick growing like most birch. I really encourage you to add this to your plant list. Um, again, if nothing else for diversity purposes, but I think you'll be certainly impressed by the bark. Um, as I showed in this picture, it's a little bit smoother in the early stages, but becomes a little bit more exfoliating and plated in the older, in the um, later years. Um, American Linden, you know, as a beekeeper myself, uh, if you've ever had Linden honey, it is out of this world. Uh, it is just light. It is just really sweet. Um, this is one that you will find in many parks. Um, it is a big tree. It is without a doubt one of the bigger shade trees. Harder to come by as a straight species. There's a couple other cultivars that are out there. Many of you may have planted little leaf linden. You may have heard of silver linden as well. Little leaf linden really has succumbed to a lot of bore issues. This one, on the other hand, uh, does not succumb to those same bore issues. It's a tried and true plant, like I like to say. It's a little bit soft wood, so if we get the right storms, if we get those kind of wind shears, uh, it is prone to breakage, uh, but don't let that discourage you. Um, it has a great heart-shaped leaf, it has a fragrant flower, and it is um, just an overall wildlife-friendly tree, um, and not in a way that you would ever notice. Uh, the bees that pollinate it, you know, are not necessarily uh, the same thing that we're experiencing right now with the wasps. And so um, it is found uh, along with a number of sugar maples. If you go into any of the local forest preserves around here, whether it's Cook County or Lake County, you will absolutely run into a linden tree. Um, it's bark, uh, depending on how you look at it, could resemble a Norway maple, but clearly not a Norway maple. It has so many other attributes, including its heart-shaped leaves. Um, and it is just a quick growing tree. It does not have the same fall color um, as some of the other maples, um, but that's fine. I think, again, if you are looking for a tried and true tree, um, one that will, you know, be around for generations, this is one that I would put on your short list. Um, and again, um, encourage you maybe to stay away from Little Leaf Linden. 
uh, that particular tree has a uh, very tight branch attachments, which makes it difficult to prune also has something called included bark when it gets to that point um, and has some bore issues, as I mentioned. American yellowwood. So this is another one that's found a little further south. There are some native ones that you will see kind of few and far in between here. Um, this is one that's considered somewhat endangered down south, believe it or not. Um, and so when I get questions about, you know, is there any summer flowering trees, you know, this is one that comes to mind. Uh, great fall color, as you can see to the left, these unbelievable flowers to the right, um, they kind of hang there in a pea-like structure. Um, and so they are fragrant, drawback to this tree, um, just like the basswood is somewhat weak wooded, um, can break apart in storms. Um, again, don't let that deter you. Um, you just don't know when the right storm is going to come through here. And so if you're looking for a tree that is somewhat unique, that has a great flower in the summertime, that has these cascading look of flowers, this is one that I would certainly consider. Um, it's a medium tree. It has great bark um, for the wintertime. And so um, a specimen plant, uh, you can plant it in um, a mass so that you have just this abundance of fragrant flowers. Um, and so it's one that um, I'd certainly consider using, um, even though it's slow growing, because we have these heavy clay soils here in a lot of areas, it is somewhat adaptable, it does not like to be over watered though. Here's kind of the close up of that nice gray bark. Um, we're gonna talk about a tree here uh, in just a couple seconds that also has gray bark. Um, solid yellow fall color, but I mean, look at that flower to the white, or to the, sorry, the flower to the left, uh, that's white. Um, it is just, like I said, uh, super fragrant. Um, for those of you who may live and know where black locust trees are, a lot of us consider those weed trees, but that is an incredibly fragrant uh, flower as well. And it just literally lights up subdivision when there's a number of, in, of them in there. And I feel this tree will do the same for you. Uh, again, not too overwhelming like some of the other bigger shade trees we've looked at earlier. Winter King Hawthorne. Uh, so this is also known as green Hawthorne and there's a number of Hawthorne species. And this is a little bit further south uh, than we are here in Chicago. But we see this tree in the trade as Winter King Hawthorne. Um, and some of the great attributes of this tree is it has an exfoliating bark. It has some crimson in the bark. You can see to the right that the birds love it. Um, and this year in my own property, unfortunately, I lost a lot of native hawthorns. And I saw a lot of native hawthorns, not only in forest preserves and city parks and other areas, um, really just uh, unexpectedly die. And I don't know if it's from the last three years of having excessive record-breaking rains or the last two years of having excessive droughts or perhaps it was the amount of snow we had, perhaps it was the polar vortexes. I don't know, but I've noticed a lot of the native hawthorns are really looking poor. Um, and outside of one of the diseases I'll share with you in a second, these are more environmental conditions. You know, the weather certainly had an impact on some of our native plants, um, and I just don't have an answer why. But this one um, seemed to weather the storm. Uh, it's a great plant. Um, it has a pyramidal crown, as I mentioned, multicolored flaky bark. Uh, the white flowers kind of come out as the leaves emerge. And so the green leaf, dark green leaf, makes a great backdrop. Um, and then the red fruits are a great attribute, certainly good for birds. I think I heard yesterday that um, some statistic of, you know, over 35,000 birds would start flying south, or maybe it's 350,000 birds were going to start migrating south. Um, for the winter already. And so these types of food sources are really important. Um, and it's one that I actually make jam out of. And so this is one that um, I will go ahead and make jam out of Thai and pectin. Um, and I actually um, end up adding a little bit more pectin just to get it to harden, but it's a great plant to make jam out of if you don't, um, if you decide that you don't want to share with the birds the whole time. But look at this exfoliating bark right here. You can see the copper, you can see the white flower to the left and the berries, really abundant and it's berries. Berries, the only plant um, in the hawthorn family that uh, I like more is probably downy hawthorn. That is a, what I consider an old school plant that a lot of designers, including Jens Jensen, used to use back in the day. It's not so readily available in the trade anymore. Um, and so I've planted this one um, uh, because of the exfoliating bark. 
not to the point that birch have this uh, cinnamon color, but it's certainly enough that it's going to catch your eye and the berries really offset it. What we do run into though, and I mentioned I would discuss is hawthorn, uh, cedar hawthorn rust. Um, and if you have a cedar in the area, and even if you don't, your neighbors do, or someone a mile away does, your plant can get this. Um, it is treatable. Um, it is um, kind of more aesthetic than anything else. It will impact the fruits. As you can see to the far right, you kind of get these um, fungal um, pathogens on the fruit. You will get kind of this rust. Um, it's very similar to apple scab. So if you're gonna treat for hawthorn or cedar hawthorn rust, um, you're gonna wanna treat in the springtime. Depending on the products that your arborists use, you might find a chemical that needs to be applied every seven to 10 days. Perhaps it's every 10 days, perhaps it's every 15 to 20 days. It's really important as a consumer that you know what these people are putting on your tree because as we take prescription medicines, it tells us that we need to take this three times a day for five days. And if you don't take that as followed, prescription really isn't working the way it should. The same is true with a lot of these products that we use on our trees. There is a recommended rate of application, not only in the volume, but also in the timing of it. And so, if your tree care provider is giving you a service and that product is every 10 days and they're showing up every 17 days, it's not going to be effective and you're going to go ahead and have some of these problems. So I don't want to see you spending your money um, for products if they're not following the recommended rate uh, at application. So please consider that when you're talking to your arborists. This is another one, uh, American beach. Um, a lot of us here have never really seen a native beach. Uh, if you go again up to Door County, you'll see a lot of uh, native beaches, but here uh, we're usually dealing with the European beach. So those are a lot of them that have different colors, maybe purples, maybe tricolor beach, which was one of my favorites. But the American beach is straight green. Um, it still has that gray bark, kind of like we saw with the yellow wood. Um, if you look at the trunk of some of these beech trees, they almost look like elephant legs. They get so big. They have this nutlet over here uh, to the right side. And so, you know, beech are unbelievably big trees. Uh, they are related to oaks um, and they um, are loved by wildlife and they're loved by people who drink Budweiser beer. So yes, that whole Beechwood H thing is true. Um, they actually use beech chips to go ahead and brew their beer. And so, um, you know, if it's not enough to help support the wildlife, um, certainly supporting uh, the beer industry and, and the beech trees there is, is equally important for some of you. So um, the great tree, um, it's not readily available as an American beach. You'll, again, you'll find the European beach. So certainly reach out to um, people like Chalet early on. You know, we have a group of plant buyers who buy plants all over the country. And so if you can tell us um, that you're looking for something and give us an idea of what it is you're looking for, there's a very good chance that we can find it for you. And like I said, plants like beech trees and some of the others dig better in the spring. And so, you know, if you see something you like here or you've done some research, reach out to, you know, one of our representatives here uh, and ask us if we can find it for you because American beech, I know of a couple of local growers that have them, but you're not going to find it in the trades as much as some of the other plants. Um, but unfortunately, uh, for those people who have summer homes in Michigan, who have toured Michigan, there's a new beach disease and it's a beach bark disease, which unfortunately makes these trees prone to breakage. You can see the picture to the right. Um, and so, you know, they don't mature. They normally start getting this disease sometimes greater than eight or 10 inches in diameter. You can see kind of the red pustules on this. Um, and this is a relatively new disease. Um, it hasn't necessarily made its way um, to the North Shore. It's still across the lake. Part of the reason could be because we don't have a lot of American beach. Um, I'm unsure if this is going to affect the European beach in the same way. Um, I can think of a small pocket of American beach um, along one of the ravines that I know is native. But again, unless you have a food source for a lot of these things, um, they're really not going to become a major problem. And so unlike Dutch elm disease in the American elm or emerald ash borer in the green and white ash, we had big food sources, so they became a problem quickly. Serviceberry, uh, one of my favorites. Um, so this is more of a suckering shrub. A lot of people plant um, uh, Amelanchor grandiflora um, autumn blaze, which is more of an ornamental serviceberry. Wouldn't consider it a true native, although it is a serviceberry nonetheless. It is an Amelanchor. Um, this particular plant 
um, is just a great plant. It has an edible berry that um, in the grandiflora version, I make a ton of pies with. Um, the birds love this plant. They get a little punch drunk by eating the berries. So if you see somebody um, who is a little bit, um, you know, knocking on your window and seems a little discombobulated, the birds get a little drunk from it. The white flower is certainly a cellar flower in the springtime. And of course it has great fall color. So again, this kind of falls in that four season category. You will find this tree predominantly multi-stem. They are starting to um, go ahead and get a lot of the service berries in single stem tree form. If you're downtown Lake Forest and you happen to be by the train station, those are all single stem service berries. And so that can give you an idea. It almost looks like the Carpinus uh, in its shape that we talked about earlier, but it has these actual really neat attributes. And so, um, you know, I mentioned uh, the foliage, the berries, the flowers. Um, those are all things that I want you to consider living in Chicago. We have four distinct seasons. And so a lot of times I hear people say, I want a crab apple because I love the flower. Well, that's only two, two weeks out of the year. You know, we have so many more weeks that we need to be enjoying our plants. And so bark, berries, um, foliage, fall color, spring flower, those are all things that help us get through uh, each year. Um, and so this is one that you will see usually suckering um, in natural habitats. A lot of times you'll find it next to that Carpinus that we looked at. Um, and it's a really great naturalizing plant. Um, it can get some scab issues like some of the other um, plants in this family, uh, but nothing that I'd really be concerned about. And so here's the berry. Um, you can see the, the gray bark to the upper right hand corner. That green that you see, that green is something that you'll see on a number of plants. Those are lichens. They live in a symbiotic relationship with many plants. A lot of times they're found on the north or the east side of the tree. And so that's nothing to worry about. You can see on the lower left, uh, the multi-stem. Uh, and then just above that is the same multi-stem, but with the white flowers. Um, and every tree that flowers has a fruit, whether it's an acorn or a berry, you know, that's how it keeps its um, succession plan going. And so um, this is not a messy plant because the birds usually beat you to uh, the berries before you even notice them. Black gum, um, this is a great plant. Um, you know, it's kind of a sleeper plant. Uh, you'll actually see this at the Botanic Gardens on the north side of the pond. Um, there's a number of these growing. You can see the horizontal branching. So if you like that horizontal branching, like go to dogwood, um, it is a great tree. You see this dark green glossy leaf. Sometimes it's referred to as sourwood a little further south. Um, but boy, look at that fall color. That is just a great fall color. Um, a friend of mine has a newer cultivar he's introducing, um, and it happened to do with the branching and the fall color that it was slightly different than the native species. And so I think I mentioned earlier, you know, these people make their money um, by propagating and developing new trees and slight variances in whether it's a shrub or a tree or a perennial um, creates a new product. And in this case, he's got one that has uh, distinctively uh, horizontal branching and a good fall color. And so, um, you know, it's hard to believe that this tree gets 90 feet tall. Most of the trees around here are going to be in the 30 to 50 foot range. Um, and keep in mind when you are on the internet and you are doing research, don't always be discouraged on how big something gets. Um, that could be the minority, you know, so this tree could get 90 feet tall. But a majority of these trees are going to stay within the 30 to 50 foot range here in Lake and Cook counties. And so, you know, I don't want you to think because you see this is going to be 90 feet tall, um, that indeed it's going to be 90 feet tall. Keep in mind that 90 feet could mean it's 150 years to get to that point. So you're planting these trees not only for your generation, but for the next generation as well. You know, I encourage you not to make the mistake of planting it in front of your picture window. Um, so giving any of these trees that are supposed to get at least 30 and 50 feet tall, the appropriate distance and uh, location in your yard. But, you know, keep in mind, these are the optimum heights and widths they can grow and isn't always typical for our areas where we have, you know, weather issues, where we have salt um, from the roadways, where we have chemicals being used, where we have pools, where we have houses. And so um, let that be. Um, just a little bit of thought uh, when you're going ahead and sourcing these trees. Um, great nectar source for bee. Again, as a beekeeper, I, I think about a lot of these things. 
Uh, the dark blue fruits are attractive to wildlife. Again, not something that you're really going to notice on this particular tree, um, but they do like more of an acidic soil. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. If you don't know what your soil pH is, pH is, there's some home test kits you can use. You can also send it in to the extension services. Uh, and that's a great place to start um, because like I said, it's very hard to take a alkaline soil and make it acidic. Um, it just takes years and years and years. So you can see the berries, um, very similar uh, to some of the other plants. Um, many of you may not know that um, burning bush get little berries. They look like little Skittles hanging from the tree. So if you're familiar with those um, or nanny berry, they're very similar to that. Uh, but you can see the dark green glossy leaf to the left and the bright red foliage to the right. Um, again, I, I love everything about fall. I love the weather. I love the smells. I love the fall color. Um, and so fall color is one of the things that I use in my bucket list of things when I'm picking plants. So what we really haven't talked about is any of the evergreens and there's not a lot of native evergreens, um, you know, and so I'm going to go ahead and just touch base on a couple. White pine um, is one of my favorites. It's light, it's lacy, it's soft, it grows exceptionally big, it has more of an open appearance the bigger it gets. Um, it can handle the shade well. Um, blue spruce have really taken it on the chin over the last several years through cytospora canker, through needle cast, and a number of other diseases. Like river birch, they get to the point where you're just starting to enjoy them and they start to get sick. And so, you know, we have to think about the short and the long term care of these plants. And I don't want you to purchase a plant where you start to really enjoy it and then it costs more to maintain it than the value you're actually getting out of it or it thins out. White pines, they're very sensitive to urban pollution. Um, and so maybe living here in Wilmette or Winnetka or further north, you may not see that, but perhaps in the city, depending on where you are, you might see um, some yellowing, some discoloration, some stress in the plant. They're a great indicator for uh, kind of urban pollution. But um, one of my faves, um, as a matter of fact, I'm gonna be planting some this weekend at my house. I found some smaller ones. Um, and I just needed them to fill in and I know that they're quick growers. Um, the other thing that I want to note in, in any evergreen, especially the ones that were recently transplanted, if you are buying or have bought some evergreens from us and you want to go ahead uh, and ensure they're going to be healthy trees for the long run, it's really important that you water them in throughout the season and especially closer to that Thanksgiving time period. As we start to put away our hoses and stuff, these trees, they hold moisture in their leaves and they desiccate in the winter time. And you'll see that with your boxwood and you'll see that with even some white pines getting some burning. Um, and so it's really important that moisture gets into their leaves uh, and their needles so that when they are going into the winter months that they're well hydrated so that when they come out of winter, uh, they can kind of pick up where they left off. It will keep you from you know, calling uh, your local professional, asking them why your tree looks sick. Um, nine times out of 10 in April, it's because of the desiccation. Um, the flip side to that is just like deciduous trees, trees that lose their leaves in the fall, evergreens also lose their needles. And so if you see a white pine or you see a spruce that's kind of brown on the inside, that's just a natural shedding. Some years are more uh, than others. And so um, that is a common occurrence, a lot more noticeable sometimes on white pines because they're a little bit looser, it's easier to see. Um, when you look on the ground in a forest uh, where there's white pines, you'll see a ton of needles, that is a natural occurrence. So please don't be discouraged if the interior of your plant is turning brown and shedding, that is common. What's not common is to have the exterior part, the tips of your needles browning. Um, and so, like I said, there are just some really big white pines. If you happen to come across them, it's hard to put two people's arms around them. Uh, their needles are super soft, so they're not like the spruce trees. Um, and they just have a graceful um, habit to them. I just think they're an underused plant sometimes um, and can be artistic uh, as well. Cedars, this is one that uh, we're kind of leaning back on. So, uh, you know, this was a plant that was commonly used before. A lot of times you'll actually see it in roadside ditches. They have these great berries. Um, it has a juniper smell to it. Um, and so these are slow growing trees, but they've come a long way um, as far as being a plant that is tried and true. We are running out of options in our urban landscape with a lot of plants. So 
What I mean by that is, you know, we kind of all hop on this what's hot bandwagon and we overplant Austrian pines. And next thing you know, we have the Plodia tip light. We overplant our blue spruce and we have just like Tasper canker. You know, this is one of those plants that really over the last 40, 50, 60 years was never overplanted. And so it's tried and true and has remained somewhat disease free. You talk about cedar closets, cedar boards. This is a cedar tree, so it's pests are minimal. It does have one, it's more aesthetic than anything else. And so this is one that we have in a couple of different flavors here at the nursery that I would encourage you to try. The blueberry and a lot of them really sets it off and gives it a nice sense of depth and character to it. Um, and it can be used as a hedge like an arborvitae, but it's gonna require a little bit more sun. Um, and so it is pyramidal like a lot of the arborvitaes. Um, it can grow to 40, 50 feet in height. Although that's really a long, long time down the road. So um, I don't want you to think that, you know, you're going to have this tree 40 or 50 feet in height in probably 10 years. That's not the case. It's going to be more like 40 or 50. Um, this can be a great accent plant or it can be a great hedge in a small confined area, whether that be a patio or a deck area. This is one that I want you to consider um, if you've got a little bit more sun. Now, you know, this is what it does get. Um, and this is part of that hawthorn cedar rust. So there's this, you know, part of this cycle um, where these plants are passing these diseases onto each other. A um, little bit creepy on the right. Um, it's a soft kind of mushy um, fungus. It hardens up. You can see it. It's easily pruned off. Not every plant gets this, um, but when you do see it, it's a little bit alarming. It looks like kind of a crazy urchin um, that's kind of hanging on to your plant. But not one that um, I would shy away from because of this. It's not deadly to the plant, so it's not something that is going to cause a terminal issue. So wow, that was a lot of information. Um, we have certainly covered a lot here, um, and so I just want to kind of really clear or kind of close by saying a couple different things. So you know, be observant in your yard. Um, take the time, sit on your patio. Take the time to look at your windows. Watch to see where the sun is. Um, the sun's going to be a different spot at 10 in the morning than it's going to be at two in the afternoon. You know, time to see what is full sun, what's part sun, um, and look at your yard for moisture issues. The other day we had about an inch and a half worth of rain that came really quickly. If your yard drains and that water is gone within a day, I would consider that, you know, a success. It's not something that holds water because of the duration of rain that we got in such a short period of time, uh, you're gonna see it setting up. But if it doesn't go away in a number of days, um, then you have a drainage issue. And either you need to solve that drainage issue or you need to pick plants that are gonna work in that area. Um, and talk to your experts, um, come to our nursery here, talk to, you know, Chalet, talk to your city forester, your arborists, um, you know, your landscapers, as well as, you know, look in people's yards and see what's successful. Um, you know, there's no sense in always reinventing the wheel. I am for picking those specimen trees that really set a landscape off. Um, but I also know that, um, you know, there's certain plants that work well here in the area and there's certain plants that don't. And we can't make plants work well, you know, whether it's our weather patterns, whether it's the fact that we put them where they don't belong um, or we don't plant them in a courtyard situation. We can't make a plant do well if the conditions just aren't right. Um, and so make sure you're in the right zone. Make sure that you, um, are, when you're on the internet, if you see something you like, that it is zone hardy. For those of you who live closer to the lake, you're going to be able to get away with things that maybe someone in DuPage County can't get away with. Or if you have a courtyard that is bordered by a wall, you might be able to get away with some of those Japanese maples or some of those rhododendrons, you know, if you had the right soil. And so take that in mind, um, you know, have a plan um, and use reliable sources of information. And so I always say use three reliable sources. So around here, certainly Chalet website, Botanic Gardens, Morton Arboretum, you know, any types of those, even the Missouri Botanic Gardens, I use regularly as a reliable source. So use those types of groups to help you make informed decisions and you will be better off in the long run. So with that, I think we're going to just kind of open it up to some questions and um, see what we have out there and we'll get out and everyone can enjoy their weekend. So um, the zone for overcut oak, it says, um, you know, like I said, there are uh, some overcut oaks in and around the Chicago area. You're going to find them a little further south. Um, but I think that uh, they are a great tree. 
somewhat underused. I planted my first one just a couple of years ago, so I can't give you any more information than I personally read. Um, and so I don't work with them on a regular basis. And so just to give you a little background, I was a city forester in Lake Forest for a number of years. I ran the forestry department as well as the parks department. And so I've been able and had the luxury of working with a lot of trees in the area. Um, and there's trees that, you know, I just have not had a chance to work with for 30 years. And this happens to be one of them. And so um, I don't know if we can show, I got a question about, uh, can we show the Hackberry slide again, um, as far as um, the attributes. And so we're gonna post this on YouTube. Uh, so you'll be able to look at it um, later in the day, I think, if not tomorrow. Um, and then you can kind of go through these slides one by one, pick up the attributes that work for you. Um, keep in mind, great resources out there. And so I want to encourage you to use them. So um, I got a comment here. It says, I have an old Hawthorne that is dying due to age. Uh, I'd like another Hawthorne, but was told uh, that the nurseries do not recommend them due to the gall. Um, and that Hawthorne is an awesome tree. And I agree with you, Hawthorne is an awesome tree. Um, you know, they do have the, the cedar apple rust or the Hawthorne rust that we do get. That can be sprayed in the springtime. Um, you know, keep in mind, Hawthorne um, has a number of different attributes. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. So for example, as a city forester, I never planted Winter King Hawthorne or cockspur hawthorn because there's a liability in planting thorns, right? And so we never wanna plant something where somebody can get hurt. Um, but if you have a yard where it's more native and you can get away with planting thorns and it's a protection area for wildlife such as birds, it's a great plant to plant. And so um, getting back to this question about should I plant hawthorns, I would say, you know, winter king hawthorn is a great plant to try. You're gonna get the added benefit of having uh, the exfoliating bark. Um, and with this particular hawthorn, it has what we call spurs. It's not actually true thorn. So they're very, very similar um, to let's say a crab apple. And even though you will see a thorn or two, they're not as numerous as Coxburg or Washington hawthorn. So um, I've got another question about, should I feed my service berry uh, at any time? Um, you know. Fertilization is certainly something you can do. I don't think we need to pump our plants full of nitrogen all the time. There's a lot of organic teas and organic products that we can use on a regular basis that I think um, our soils naturally give us. Uh, so when we put down leaf mulch, when we put down things like wood chips, those turn to organic matter, which are beneficial for our trees. And so um, I think that's something that you should consider using. Um, you know, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are usually the three numbers that we see on a bag. And so I just wouldn't push nitrogen as much. Um, it says, do we have a handout? Um, and not one that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, you know, if you go on the city of Lake Forest website, again, where I worked for, you know, over 25 years, there is a handout that I did with the garden club called trees that are recommended for Lake Forest landscapes. It's just um, some hand-drawn figures and that gives you some ideas uh, as well as the attributes like we shared with you today. Um, and so um, let's see. Um, there's another interesting one uh, about sugar maples and uh, squirrels. And so in the springtime, we see the squirrel activity in the elms being pretty active. What they're doing is they're going out to the farthest edges of the branches and they're biting the twigs off so the seeds drop and then they're gathering the seeds. We're actually seeing that now with the maple trees. Um, for those of you who have maple trees, you may recognize what we call samaras or the helicopters that fall. Um, the squirrels will go to the end of those branches. They will bite the uh, end of the branches so that those seeds fall. And then they'll go ahead and either cache those for later or they'll go ahead and eat those. So um, that's just something that we uh, happen to see early in the spring with the elms and further um, in the fall with uh, the maples. And, um, you know, just last question, what do I think of black hog viburnum? I think it's a great plant. Uh, it is one that has great fall color, uh, has great shape, um, is another tried and true. Interesting enough about this plant, if they really like where they're at, they end up sending rhizomes out. And we see a lot of suckers uh, that can come from them. And so they can create a hedge quite regularly if it's not maintained. Um, and so if your landscaper uh, is maintaining it um, and cutting those out, then you'll just see a single plant. If it's more of a natural area, uh, they'll go ahead and um, you know be more of a suckering shrub. So 
So that was native trees um, kind of in a nutshell. So uh, I hope you got a lot out of it. Um, you know, I encourage you to come to our nursery. Uh, we do have a lot of natives that are still available, whether it be birch or some of the oaks. We've got some unique oaks here um, that are in the back. And so that's where a lot of our shade trees are. Um, for those of you who have questions, I certainly encourage you to reach out to your chalet representative, um, ask them some of these questions. Um, you know, talk to your neighbors, talk to the experts and um, get the right tree for the right area. So hopefully I'll see you guys next time. I hope you have a great weekend and thanks for joining us.